America needs a war. Any war. I think I should welcome almost any war, for I think this country needs one. Theodore Roosevelt, future president of the United States in 1897. Hello and welcome to Small Gold, in case you missed it. Top gold and silver stories for the week ended March 4th, 2017. Well, we're going to go back to the 19th century, the end of the 19th century, with a quote from future president Teddy Roosevelt on war. I should welcome almost any war, for I think this country needs one. A year later, Teddy Roosevelt himself was riding up San Juan Hill in Cuba, fighting a war. The Spanish-American War began in 1898. Since then, the United States has been involved in dozens of military campaigns over the past 120 years. Now, most of these wars have involved fighting Muslims or Russians. So let's keep that in mind when we move up to the present day. War is one of the certain ways to unify a nation. But today, the United States is divided over which war and with whom to fight, Muslims or Russians. And we're going to see the relevance on that on the gold market as we do a quick history review of U.S. wars and military involvement since 1898. And one thing that is kind of staggering about this list here is the United States has been engaged in its military basically every year since 1898, starting with the Spanish-American War, then we moved to the Philippine-American War from 1898 to 1902, there was the Boxer Rebellion in China where the United States had troops, there was the Moro Rebellion versus the Philippine Muslims at the end of the Philippine-American War, they battled those until 1913, there was a border war with Mexico in 1910, there were the ongoing banana wars in Nicaragua, Haiti, Dominican Republic from 1912 all the way into the Great Depression. Then there was World War I, which the United States did not get into, and Teddy Roosevelt was giving speeches encouraging Woodrow Wilson to get into World War I. And when the United States finally got into World War I, Teddy Roosevelt showed up at Woodrow Wilson's office and begged him to let him get involved and lead a set of troops in World War One. Whatever you want to say about uh, Teddy Roosevelt, he did put his money where his mouth was. He did lead the charge on San Juan Hill. He did want to get involved in World One, World War One personally. He did not just want to send troops there. He was not a chicken hawk. He was a hawk hawk. And indeed, at one point, he had given a speech when he was running for president. He got shot. And instead of going to the hospital, he went, gave the speech, and then went to the hospital. So Teddy Roosevelt certainly had a rugged character. And regardless of his politics, you have to respect someone who will actually do what he wants others to do. Then the United States had World War II, 1941 to 1945. And then, having been aligned with Russia... The United States was an ally of Russia. Joe Stalin, the communist dictator, was called Uncle Joe to make him sound better and more attractive to the Americans while Americans were fighting the evil Hitler. Then, at the end of World War II, Russia became the enemy. Why Russia favored communism? They always favored communism since 1917. But no matter when you're fighting Hitler, communism is okay. Once Hitler is gone, communism is not okay. And Russia is the demon. Russia remains a demon for the entire period of the Cold War until 1991. The United States fights in the Korean War. Sends, uh, they have the Bay of Pigs issue fiasco, the CIA fiasco. The United States was involved in the Dominican Republic Civil War, the Vietnam War, the Lebanese War, the invasion of Grenada, the Tanker War. All these wars, not the Tanker War, but up to the... In the oh no, that Tanker War too, and the invasion of Panama. All these wars and were part of the Cold War and to try to push back Russian, Chinese, communist influence in Southeast Asia, in Korea, anywhere in the world, and certainly keep the communists out of the Middle East, out of U.S. spheres of influence, which means the entire world. Well, when the Cold War ended, I remember a couple of years prior to the Cold War ending reading Foreign Affairs, the Council on Foreign Relations 
kind of academic journal that the real threat was going to be going forward the uh, not the Russians, it was going to be Islamic, uh, I don't think they called it extremism at the time, but Islamic terrorism. And that was kind of what they were transitioning towards, that the enemy would no longer be Russia, it would be uh, Islamic terrorism. And the reason they knew that was the United States was funding, in part and parcel of its battle against Russia in the Cold War, the Osama bin Laden to fend off the Russians who had invaded Afghanistan. So from then on, from 1991 to the current day, the United States has transitioned from fighting Russia to fighting Muslim terrorism. Now, it hasn't always been in... Uh, they haven't always used the term fighting Muslims. However, the battles have been on Muslim ground. So for example, the first Persian Gulf War was not a war on Islam, was not a war against... Uh, the Islamic faith. However, the wars were all directed towards those areas of the world which are predominantly Muslim. So you had the Persian Gulf War, you had the Somali Civil War, U.S. intervention in Haiti, not Muslim, uh, the Bosnian War, the Kosovo War, the Afghanistan War, the Iraq War, the two Iraq Wars, the War on Terror in Pakistan, intervention in Libya, war with ISIL, ISIS, again, all mostly wars with Muslim, uh, predominantly Muslim populations. Now what's happened since Donald Trump has come in in 2017, we're now fighting, or the United States is now fighting Russians and Muslims. Because normally the party in power is anti-war, is, is, is for the war, and the party out of power is anti-war. And that's generally how they line themselves up politically, Hey, we're against this war. Vote for us next time. We'll end the war. That's how Nixon ran in 1968, 1972. He had a secret plan to end the Vietnam War. Bring me in and I'll stop the war. And that's generally how it goes. So the party in power generally wants the war. And then the party out of power wants to end the war. And that's how they win political points. We now have a very strange thing happening with the out of power party, the Democrats, rather than promoting anti-war, are promoting another war, and that war is to bring back the war against Russia. Today, Democrats, President Obama, having fought in Muslim lands for the last eight years while in power, now want to fight the Russians. Even though while in power, they had favored the Russians. If you recall Obama in the debates with Romney in 2012, Romney was complaining that the Russians were this big threat, and Obama reminded or chided uh, then candidate Romney, uh, the 80s called and they want their foreign policy back, making it sound like Romney was out of touch for even thinking that Russia was an enemy. And then later on, also, Obama had spoken to the Russian delegate and he told the Russian delegate that in, in res with respect to reducing nuclear arms, I'll have more flexibility after the election. So clearly there was a, a continuation of the concept of detente that was something that Nixon had uh, started with Russia in the 70s to kind of cool the, the tensions between the two superpowers. And after the Cold War ended, Russia kind of became not irrelevant, but they kind of became not on the radar, scene, radar screen as being a geopolitical force that the United States had to oppose. And that was confirmed with... Um, President Obama's treatment of Russia, at least early on in his administration, where Russia was not a problem and he was working with Russia, not opposed to Russia. Russia became a boogeyman in late in early 2016 when it became used as a political ploy to be to show that President Trump and his associates somehow had Russian ties, and therefore Russia would be the enemy for interfering with our election. Hillary Clinton started saber-rattling that if Vladimir Putin did some cyber terrorism or cyber hacking, then we would respond not only via uh, cyber retaliation, but even with physical uh, military retaliation. So the Democrats have switched from being the party of anti-war or the party that was 
not hostile to Russia, to now being very much in favor of painting Russia and their political opponents as being in bed with Vladimir Putin and the Russians. So the Red Scare is back, even though the Russians are no longer communist or red. Now, the Republicans had been, during the time period in which the Democrats were in power, had endorsed the fighting of Muslims. But they, some of them, like Romney and McCain, had also opposed Russians simultaneously. But now, under Trump, the, the, the Republicans are now focused on increasing their fight against Muslims. But the war on ISIS, and even going as far as to setting up the so-called Muslim ban, travel ban, against Muslim countries. Something that the Democrats or the Obama administration had not done or at least did not publicize, or the media did make a big deal out of it, even though the, Dem the uh, Obama did put a ban on refugees from Iraq for a period of time while he was in power. But clearly the Republicans, or Trump now favors fighting Muslims, is talking about getting along with Russia, getting along with Putin. And the Democrats, rather than spending most of their time criticizing the Republican increase in the war against Muslims and ISIS is spending its time trying to convince the American public that the Russians are indeed the enemy and we have an enemy within because that enemy is the president and he is in a sense a Russian agent. And of course Trump taking to the Tweety public pu pulpit just as Roosevelt once called the presidential being the president you know the bully pulpit Trump is using his favorite form of communication, which is Twitter, the Tweety pulpit, he immediately attacks uh, President Obama by saying, after Obama, he criticized Obama for supposedly bugging Trump Tower. He points out the supposed hypocrisy of Obama, who's now vehemently against the Russians, as who was it that secretly said to Russian President, tell Vladimir that after the election I'll have more flexibility. So now the battle is between the Americans. Who is our enemy? Is it, are they Muslims? Are they Russians? Are they both? And who is best equipped to fight these two enemies? So America needs a war, any war, and now they need many wars. If the US doesn't have a war to fight, they fight each other over whom they should be fighting. So there is no peace dividend. That was one of the things they talked about at the end of the Cold War. Now the U.S. would not have to spend trillions of dollars in defense or billions of dollars in defense because they no longer had to worry about Russia. Well, that quickly morphed into money that had to be spent to fight Muslim countries and the war on terror. So, as Greek philosopher Heraclitus once said, war is the father and king of all. Some he has made gods, and some men, some slaves, and some free. I think we are now entering a period where we will see many types of wars, internal wars between the U.S., uh, political parties, and also that could spill over into shooting wars already has with the rest of the world. Now, why is all this important? Well, one of my theses on gold and silver is that they seem to perform well in times of political turmoil. This is a new type of dynamic in the United States where the Democrats who normally should be fighting the Republicans tooth and nail against the wars that the Republicans wish to fight. Instead, they are urging that we need to fight another war and that war is against Russia. And not only is that war against Russia, but that the president and his associates are part of Russia, and therefore they need to be attacked. So it's almost, in a, se in a sense, a civil war, because it is not a matter of the Democrats saying they don't like the policies of the Republicans, their war policies, fighting ISIS, or their spending policies. They're saying they don't like the fact that the enemy, Russia, is part and parcel of the current administration. I think if you think that one through, you can see how that has a big difference, and that is going to lead to plenty of political turmoil. All right, let's get to the rest of the gold and silver news. Top story, Donald Trump accuses Barack Obama of bugging Trump Tower. 
silver fell for the first time in a week, the first week in 2017, falling 2.1%. After it had broken $18 last week, it fell to $17.94 this week. It had gotten, we'll show you a chart in a minute, smashed midweek, I think it was Wednesday, and did regain some of its uh, losses, on, especially on Friday. Gold fell 1.8% down to $12, $1,234. We're still under 70 to 1 on the gold silver ratio. You can check that chart out. You can also click here. And you can see the uh, gold silver ratio live and over time. Tweet of the week. Then do a chart of the week. Here we are. While the Democrats are accusing Trump of being a Russian agent and therefore Russia is the enemy. And by extension, Donald Trump is the enemy. Donald Trump tweets back that, well, we have plenty of pictures of Democrats with Russians. Maybe we're all the enemy. Who knows? Oh, if you enjoy these podcasts, if you don't, then you can stop listening right now. But if you enjoy these podcasts and you wish them to continue, please consider donating to Small Gold via PayPal or Small Gold uh, Bitcoin account. The address is below this podcast, or becoming a Patreon. I don't have any Patreon. They say that's like the biggest thing on the web. A lot of people make donations via Bitcoin and also by uh, PayPal, but no one has become a Patreon. So if you want to become the first small gold Patreon, the link is below, and you can sign up and agree to pay a small monthly amount or large monthly amount if you wish. Thank you for those who are donating to Small Gold. Also, if you wish to buy gold or silver, not a recommendation or investment advice that you do so, Small Gold has affiliate arrangements with a number of bullion dealers, including BGA, BGASC, Golden Eagle Coins, JM Bullion, Money Metals Exchange, and also SD Bullion. So if you're interested in buying gold or silver, please compare pricing and shipping on the Small Gold site through the links and the banners or through the links below this YouTube and uh, you can then buy and if you do buy full disclosure small gold gets a small commission so that's another way small gold funds the site not by touting gold or silver but providing silver and gold information and if you decide to buy gold or silver through your own investigation not just from what you hear on small gold then please consider making your purchases through the small gold site all right, enough promotion. Let's get back to the top gold and silver stories of the week. Earlier this week, we talked about the Canadian Mint releasing its third quarter financial results, including their gold and silver sales for the third quarter, ended September 30, 2016. Very, 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 very late. Why was it late? Because they had to restate their financial results because of these coins they were selling, these face value coins. I'm not going to go through the whole story. If you're interested in why the Canadian Mint restated their financial results and what these face value coins were you can click on the link canadian mint restates financial results or you can check out the youtube below this youtube gold um just an interesting point i mention this all the time why the physical market does not drive this the price and why the paper market drives the price is that gold demand is 173 billion last year according to bloomberg calculations based on world gold council data but that's the same amount that gets cleared through london's otc market in about seven days so the paper trading in london otc in the comex is massive in fact they can trade half they can trade the annual global silver mining production in a few days so they're not really trading gold or silver they're trading the concept of the price of gold and silver and because they do it in such volumes that's what controls the price not the actual physical sales or physical uh, gold or silver demand. There's some stories here on Greek gold, how much they hold. A story here about prohibiting dredging machinery in New Hampshire gold prospecting. Again, I don't go through them all. You should visit the site. You should look at these links. Some of these links may be very interesting. I don't have time to discuss them all. I have read them, but I don't necessarily make them into a story or, or even cover them in the re weekly review. Now, the Swiss National Bank, I don't know why they said this, but they said cash will remain a crucial part of the financial system. Good to hear. But just keep in mind, the Swiss National Bank has lied before. They had said they wouldn't depeg the, the Swiss franc to the euro, and they did. So it's nice that they said it, but let's see if they remain uh, true to that. Now, one reason is that cash, 
some people have told me, it's a very good point, that cash will never fully go away because governments actually need cash to conduct uh, covert activities to make payments. So anything that's on the blockchain or anything that's got a wire transfer that they can track, that's not good for covert activities. They're always going to need cash. So that may be one reason why cash will always be around. Economic data, you know, the economic data has been the stuff that comes out. You can look through, I, I do post the data as it comes out. It hasn't been that good, hasn't been that bad. Core durable goods down a bit, durable. You could see here, there's no real clear trend up or down. U.S. Mint sales update, I do cover it daily and the numbers are here. I don't go through them, but I do publish at the end of each month. Uh, and I also tweet each day the sales figures, but each month I do a wrap up. And just so happens we have February numbers this past week. So there are podcasts, uh, YouTubes and blog posts with charts on them that you can check out. Uh, OK, so the Fed's been talking a lot this past week and they've basically trying to convince the markets that, yes, indeed, there will be a rate hike in March. Fed Williams says rate increase up for serious consideration at Fed's March meeting. Dudley, another Fed president, the case for rate rise is more compelling. So it looks like they're going to raise rates in January. We'll see later. There's a few more comments. Now, higher prices slam American Silver Eagle sales in February. We covered this earlier in the week. You can see these are February sales. This is just a chart from the blog post. I mean, from the YouTube, there's many more charts in the link to the blog post uh, that show American Silver Eagle sales. But you could see February sales, not very good, the lowest since 2008. It was a decent January sales. And that goes into the theory, prices rose significantly in February and uh, investors kind of slow down their purchases when the price goes higher. Story here on a nice find by a metal detector in England. A uh, Couple of stories on that. There's an interesting story on was downtown Muskegon, I don't know how you pronounce that, but that was, I think that's in Michigan, built with Confederate gold. There seems to have been some gold that was, I think, belonging to Jefferson Davis. And somehow the, tr the carriage he was riding with when he got captured, uh, had, he had gold in, the, in his train, you know, his, his, um, his carriages that he was taking with him while he was fleeing and apparently some may want well, apparently but one theory is that this gold was stolen and that it was brought north and was never found again so here's some data economic data you can see mm, all the data shows a bit of uh, inflation income up spending up uh, but the gdp now forecast by the atlanta fed for the first quarter is down to 1.8 percent so not really getting much of a boost in, in economic activity in January, and it doesn't look like February is doing much better. There's your donate to small gold via Bitcoin. Let's see what else we got for the week. So Kazakhstan, we cover this now monthly. It's not earth shattering news, but it is important to note. And if those of you track it, I track it now every month directly from the Central Bank of Kazakhstan. They're, you know, they're adding a few tons of gold each month. And they are now in 21st place amongst gold holding nations, another 20 tons, and they cracked the top 20. Now, I did have a silver price chart here, but it's gone. You'll have to look at the website. It'll be up on the website. Uh, but it shows that silver took a dive on Wednesday. It was a big smash down. Uh, hundreds of thousands of ounces of uh, silver sold in just a short moment, driving the price straight down. Is more gold and silver. I was on uh, with Jason Barak at Wall Street for Main Street discussing the insane valuations of these technology social media company uh, companies. And uh, if you're interested in that, there's a blog post. And you can also check out over at Wall Street for Main Street, or I've put it, embedded it right here so you can see it on the Small Gold website. Also, American Gold Eagle sales fell just like the American Silver Eagle sales fell. Same reason, price of gold had risen. And you could see that February was not a very good month. More charts at the website. 
There was a full set of yak attacks, fed yak attacks on Thursday. You had Yellen, Evans, Lacker, Powell, Fisher, all saying, you know, they're they're going to raise rates in March. So there seems to be, according to traders, a 95% chance of that. And prior to that, there was a night prior to the yak attack, there was a 90% chance. So generally, the Fed once it convinces the market that it's going to do something. Or if the market is convinced it's going to do something that's not, it tries to change their point of view. They did nothing to change the point of view that a rate hike is coming in March. So the reason gold and silver rose after that is it kind of takes some of the uncertainty out of it. The next issue is what will the Fed say when they raise rates in March and whether there's more rate hikes coming and whether the market believes them. Or if indeed the Fed doesn't raise rates, then you've got a more interesting circumstance because people are convinced, traders are convinced that the Fed will raise rates. That about does it for the week. Thank you very much for listening and please subscribe to the Small Gold site. There you will get the important blog posts sent to you immediately where you can see the charts a lot better than you can on the YouTube channel. Also subscribe to the YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter. Thank you.